Correct. Okay. So my path to my path to, to Buddhism, uh, I would say perhaps began in, in college. So for me, I had started to study religion in college as well as biology. And the study of, uh, of religion in general, I didn't study Buddhism right away. I studied a lot of different religions and Islam and um, different aspects of Christianity and philosophy of religion. And, and these all kind of brought a lot of questions up for me about who I am, what is my life about? Why am I here? Does God exist? All right, so I was starting to question the assumptions that I was raised with. Now, I was raised in a, in a mixed family. So my, fa my mother's side was Catholic. We were kind of devout Catholic. And my father's side, um, well, he was nominally Catholic, but I would say he's probably more uh, along the lines of agnostic or atheist. He was, a, he was a mechanical engineer, my father. And so he, um, he didn't get trained in, in the study of religion. And it wasn't really like a male thing to do uh, unless you wanted to become a priest, which I don't think he ever did. And that's fine. Um, and my, but on my mother's side, that's where the religion was taught and, and learned. It. And so I was in that kind of a mix there, right? What's, what's really important? My father's side was saying, my father was saying to me, you know, you have to learn how to use your brain. You have to learn how to think logically. And my mother's side had, came from a more faith perspective, that there's things beyond logic that we can't comprehend. And I got both. I got both of those kind of viewpoints. And I don't think one is more religious than the other, just because my mother's side was more faith oriented didn't mean that my father's side wasn't necessarily asking deep questions. And in fact, I think my father was, is, a, is a very spiritual person when I look back at some of the things he said. Um, so when I, uh, I had some of, some of these questions that I wanted answers to, you know, it, does God actually exist? And at the same time, I was also in a relationship with another uh, student that uh, that, um, you know, I thought as a young man, as 19 year old, 20 year old man, I thought that the purpose of relationships was for me to have or experience pleasure and joy. And that was a big delusion on my part. And what I really discovered from that relationship was that um, relationships can bring a lot of pain to our lives. And that the real purpose of relationship is to help us to grow to grow spiritually. But I didn't know that at the time and all I could feel was a lot of pain. And I wanted to get out of that. Similar to anybody who's uh, studied Buddhism and they see, ah, the first noble truth is that of suffering, that life is suffering. Okay, well, here I was, I was suffering, I was in pain. This girl I was dating kind of just dumped me and I'm just in a lot of pain and want to deal with that. And my way of dealing with, with anxiety at that time was through alcohol and drugs. And, um, and, uh, and so I, I didn't feel quite right about that either. So I had a lot of confusion, confusing and conflicting thoughts going on in my, in my heart and in my mind. So when, I, when I, I had been studying other religions at the time, and then I learned that there was a, a Zen teacher coming to the campus regularly to teach meditation. And I'd heard about a little bit about meditation. I thought, gosh, I got to learn. This was in 1994, before there was any big internet or anything like that. And so if you, wanted to, if you wanted to learn something, you had to go straight to that person and, and learn it from them. You couldn't do it online. So I went. and. Um, I listened to her speak, but mostly I, I saw the way she comported herself, her physical body. And I was very deeply moved by her words and actions being totally at one. 
I'd never seen that so close in, an, in a human being before that when somebody's words and actions are totally in sync with one another. And I saw that in her and I wanted to emulate that. I wanted to, I wanted to know that. I wanted to know how my words can be in alignment with my, my body. So um, she taught us how to meditate and I sat down next to her and after a few minutes, I felt better without having done anything. Just listened to her instruction. I noticed how still she looked. You know, I could see she was totally still. It was like looking at a flame, right? When you say you never see a human being sitting there and it was like she was just sitting like, like a flame. Totally, you know, when you look at a flame from a distance, like a, a candle flame from a distance, it looks like it's, it's compact. But when you get closer to the flame, you can see it flickers a little bit and there's, and there's fire there. So that's what I saw. I was sitting right next to her and I felt like, whoa, I, you know, and it's not something I, it wasn't like a, a delusion of my eyes. It was something I could feel inside. All right. So I sat and I thought, well, you know, when you sit next to somebody like that, you start to feel what they feel. And that was very inspiring to me. From that day forward, I never stopped sitting in meditation. So I have a regular practice. And I knew, you know, I, I felt better without having done any drugs, without drinking, uh, without sex. And I thought, wow, this practice is very powerful. I need to keep doing it for, if not for my own mental health, then just also for my spiritual health. Because I had some deep spiritual questions. What's my life about? Why am I here? And I asked, I asked my teacher, I said, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what, who I'm about, what I'm about, why I'm here, what I'm doing here. And what I really deeply appreciated that I, I feel like I, I never got from anybody was that she did not answer the question for me. She said, that's your koan, that's your question. And if I had gone to a, say, a, a priest, I would have gotten an answer. I would have been told, this is what you need to think and believe. This is what you have to do. She didn't give me that. And that was a precious, that was the most precious gift I think I could have gotten at that moment. You know, that's your question. Who are you? What are you about? And then I realized it's okay to have questions. It's okay to question what you're about. It's okay to look at that. You don't have to have all the answers. And the way that Zen works on it is that when you, um, when you have a deep, you have some deep questions like that, um, Zen encourages not thinking about them, but sitting with them in meditation. Or maybe Christians would say praying about them and letting God, let the answer come from God, Allah. But for me, it was that, you know, there's no conception, there was no, con no need to invoke the name of God or anything like that, but just to sit with my question and let it unfold and just see, open up my own heart and mind and see what comes from that. Let life be your teacher. That was, that was kind of what, what I learned from that. And uh, I didn't have any intention on becoming a priest at that time. But I knew that meditation was an important part of my path. I didn't have any intention on being a Buddhist. So uh, a year after, a year after I, uh, uh, the, the year that I graduated from college, I went to Japan to teach English. That was my purpose there is to teach English for a year. And then I was going to go to, into graduate school in a, um, a religious studies program in the state of California in Berkeley, California. And I did that and I lasted a semester when I realized this is, uh, I was way above my head and I didn't feel like I was in the right place. Um, so that led me to uh, dropping out of, out of graduate school and looking for work that I thought, thought would be meaningful. So I worked as a substitute teacher for a while until I found a, a job teaching. I ended up teaching in a, in a Catholic school and there, um, I, I realized that after five months of working with fifth graders, that I was not cut out to teach 10-year-olds. 
two classes of 30 10 year olds <laughs> that they were teaching me i was the student not the teacher and that was the, that was something that i had missed so i i you know meditation practice for me i started out and it was basically a kind of a self improvement practice and i realized that at that point after kind of i was i was kind of um, something i feel somewhat ashamed about, but I was asked to resign from my position for various reasons. There was po uh, politics within the school as well that played into it, but it was basically a very shameful feeling, you know, losing your job. And I thought at that time, you know, I, I, I don't understand what I'm doing. And I thought this meditation practice was going to help me in my life. And it obviously hasn't. So I need to study more. Uh, and then that's when I went to train with my teacher assiduously. I, I thought, you know, I don't have, I don't have a job right now. I could get another job, but I don't. And I was luckily enough financially well off enough that I could, um, I didn't have any debts. That was huge. And I didn't have a family to take care of. I was living with my parents. I didn't have a family to take care of at the time. So I said, you know, this is a t it's either now or never. And I want to go and study with that teacher, get my head clear and figure out what is my life about? Because I don't I can't do it by myself. And so that was the best move I could have made. My parents were very much uh, concerned about my mental health at that time. And they thought I you know, my father thought maybe he's schizophrenic or my mother was just really anxious about that whole thing. Like, why, why is he studying with a Buddhist teacher and, and uh, just kind of dropping out of life? But, you know, I was in a place where I, I didn't really care what they thought. And I was an adult and I had to figure these things out for myself. Um, and so I didn't, I, and also I had some academic training in religion and I knew what I was getting myself into. So I didn't do it lightly. I did, I did it with a lot of forethought. And I ended up living with that teacher for 15 years. And six years into it, I uh, ordained as a Buddhist priest. You know, so there's a that's that's a whole nother whole nother story of how that came to be. But that's it in a nutshell. One of the things that my teacher said, I mentioned um, basically doing the practice of meditation as a self improvement project. And my teacher, I remember sharing with me that there are three doorways to the Dharma, to the teachings of the Buddha. And um, there are, there's uh, the doorway of impermanence. There's the doorway of regret. And there's the doorway of self-improvement. So the doorway of impermanence means you notice on a gut level how swift change is in our life. The doorway of, of re regret or repentance, you've done something wrong that you regret and that you want to you want to repent for, right? Then the third doorway is that of self-improvement. And she said, that doorway is tricky because it's, a, it's, like a, it's like one of those revolving doors. It'll get you in, but then if you don't have an, a, another way in to get off of that revolving door, it'll just swing you back out. So you might get a little bit of the air conditioning or the heat on the inside that feels good. And then you just keep turning around and get go back out. So you have to have something deeper in order to continue on the path. So impermanence and repentance are a big part of, of that. And that's certainly the case for me. Um, so I don't wanna go into details about impermanence and re repentance right now, but that's my story in a nutshell. So um, 